Well, here we are again. Happy Sunday. Happy Sunday. This is always like my Friday. Because although you might not be working, I am. And I'm so glad to be here. Well, we are in the book of Genesis. We're back talking about Joseph. We've finally gotten through the worst of the dysfunction in families as we go through. And we went from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob. And for the rest of Genesis, which is 25% of the book, it's dedicated to Joseph. One quarter of Genesis is about one person. It's about Joseph. And so as we look at that, we know that God must have a plan. And there's lots and lots to look at with the life of Joseph, one of two people where nothing evil has been said uh, that they had perpetrated. And it's like a breath of fresh air after everything we've been through, especially with Esau's family and, uh, and Jacob and the killing in Shechem and the rape of their sister. And oh my goodness, all the drama. It's like a soap opera. But today we're going to talk about Joseph. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we so need you. We so need you to speak to our hearts, to encourage us, to give us wisdom, to help us, Lord, to confess our shortcomings and our failures, the places where we've been apathetic and we haven't drawn near to you, Lord, as we should, or shut off our phones. <laughs> Lord, we always fall short, and you're always there to pick us up, to show us your love, and give us encouragement, and help us to be renewed in our faith and our commitment to you. And I pray this morning you would do that. As we go into your word, as we see what you've done in the past, we can anticipate you will do the same, because you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. Lord, I just want to lift up this congregation and every person that's uh, watching online, and I pray Lord, that you might take hold of our hearts. The bitterness, the judgments, the disappointments, the confusion. And I pray, Lord, that you'd grant us your peace. And for this time, that your spirit would superintend my words that they might be yours, that you might help us to be renewed like the eagle. So Lord, we commit ourselves before you this day. We live in a crazy world and things are falling down all around us. And yet, Lord, you're providential. You are sovereign over all these things, and you have a destination and a plan for all of them. Give us wisdom, give us faith, Lord, to look to you this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So, we are back in the book of Genesis. Just to remind you, last week, we were in chapter 36, where we zipped through rather quickly the descendants of Esau who become the Edomites, or the Ed Edomians, later on of which Herod is one of the last to be mentioned. And uh, they basically are gone from the face of the planet. They've been incorporated into all sorts of other nations. And there was a whole bunch of uh, being hooked on phonics that I, I went through, and a whole bunch that I skipped. And then we went right to Joseph. We're introduced to Joseph in chapter 37, and we began to talk about the life and following this scarlet thread that goes through the scriptures. It starts with Abraham, who's called out of Ur, the Chaldees, as a, a worshiper of a moon god. And God speaks to him and he says, I want to do something. And uh, I'm going to pick you as my show and tell. <laughs> and he says, okay. And God begins to work through him, makes a covenant with him that's a one-sided thing where God's going to do something, and it's regardless of whether he's going to do all the right things or not. And he makes some other that are um, conditional promises, but he makes an unconditional promise that all the nations of the world would be blessed through him. 
And that's when he was in his 90s and had no children. And you know the story and how God brings it about. And so finally he has a son who's Isaac and the Lord says, go sacrifice him. And he goes, Lord, I don't know what you're doing, but okay. But you got a problem if you're going to fulfill your promise. And I, and I take this kid out. And the Lord preserves him and leaves us this perfect picture of what God did one day on that same hill by offering his only son, Jesus Christ. And we see Isaac has two children. He's got Jacob and Esau. Esau is a man of the field. He's a manly man. He's a fleshly man. He sells the blessing of God's uh, firstborn for a bowl of food. And it's the picture of the fleshly person, the person that is just occupied with the natural things, which despises the things of God. And then you see Jacob, who isn't really a prize either, who is a mama's boy, who gets involved in deceit. His mom tells him, go out and take one of the goats, one of the kid goats and sacrifice it and I'll make this meal for your dad and we'll rope him into giving you the blessing. Oh, and by the way, you're not hairy enough, so let's put some goat hair on your arms and on your neck, and uh, then you'll at least smell like Esau, and uh, you'll also feel like him, and we'll steal the blessing from your father as I'm going to make him do what God said he should do. Good luck with that, ladies. That's never a good idea. Have you ever done that? Gonna make him, I'm going to make him do... No? Okay. This is a different audience than my household, perhaps. And so Jacob then has to hightail it out of there because dad learns what happened and he shakes like a leaf and he's out of there and he goes away to Patamaram and he spends 20 years away, seven years working for one wife, seven years working for another and then he sticks around for another six years before he leaves Laban and he goes away. And you know that he has 12 sons, ultimately has 12 sons, And on the way back to where God told him to go, he went to a place he shouldn't have gone, which was Shechem. And he builds a house and he says, okay, this is good enough. Not God's plan, but it's good enough. I'm okay. I'm comfortable. And then everything busts loose. The one daughter that we know of, Dinah, she ends up getting raped, physically assaulted. And then they try a ploy to mix all the marriages and water down God's line so that the promise would not be able to be fulfilled. And instead, you get two of the brothers that take vengeance and under the guise of some religious covenant of circumcision, they get all the men vulnerable and kill them. And Jacob says, what have you done to me? (laughs) You've done all this against me and I'm in trouble and everyone's going to hate me and they're going to kill us all. And so He goes back to his land where he should have been. That's God's plan all along. So he goes back to where Bethel, where he met with the Lord near Hebron. And so we we pick up the story with with the boys. They're shepherding now and they're older. And you have Joseph, who's 17 years old. We were introduced to him last week. And he has a younger brother named Benjamin who presum- presumably is too young to be out in the field just yet. So we see Joseph, the youngest, who's been selected to be the overseer for all of them. Dad treats him special, which is a problem when you show favoritism in a family, right? How many of you were the favored child? Well, if you're an only child, it doesn't count. That's, you know, (laughs) only children are favored because there's nobody else. You know, it's just the way it is. And that's okay. How many of you were the non-favored child? (laughs) Yeah, okay, good, good, very good. You know what kind of a disparity that sets up and the kind of angst that it begins to feed inside of a family. You know, where one can never do wrong, even though they do wrong all the time. And the others, if they do one thing wrong, they're, you know, the scapegoat for everything. Well, we, we're going to look at Joseph. He goes and he tells Joseph, I want you to go and see how the boys are doing. And so his job is he's going to be a reporter. Go and see how the boys are doing with, with the sheep. And he goes out and he finds out that they're doing some things that they shouldn't be doing. And he comes back and he says, Dad! 
Because that's what 17-year-olds sound like, in my head anyway. Dad, you wouldn't believe what they're doing. They're, they're. At least that's the way my kids were. When it's somebody else that did something wrong, they're real excited to deliver that news. And we had one of those in our family. We had a reporter who was always reporting on the other one. I, I won't say who yet, but anyway. So he goes and he brings back this bad report of his brothers to his father. And if, presumably they get in trouble because dad's not happy about that. Well, we're introduced to Joseph that he's got this wonderful coat. And mostly the coats that they would wear as shepherds are sleeveless and they cut off at the knee. So they were, they were wearing kind of like a dress. But it's, it's very cool and it gives you a chance to work. But Joseph's robe had long sleeves and it went down to his ankles. It's like wearing a tuxedo to work. This kid's not going to be doing any work, obviously. And so it's a symbol, it's a sign of his dad's favor on him as he goes to tell the, tell the boys and see how they're doing. And he's got this coat, which tells everybody from a long way off just how special he is. And of course, he has a dream, and Joseph has this dream, and he says, ooh, ooh, guys, guys, i got to tell you this dream, and tells his brothers, who already hate his guts, he's going to tell them this thing that God has revealed to him. Now, it's not uncommon for God to speak to people in dreams in the Old Testament. In fact, his own father, Jacob, has had several where the Lord appears to him. Remember, he was at Bethel, and he saw this stairway with angels going up and down, up into heaven. And so there were a couple of times where the Lord spoke to Jacob exactly that way. And so here comes his son, and he says, listen, I've had this dream. We're out, we're cutting down all the, making sheaves of, of you know, lumps of stuff, and we're putting it around, and mine stands up, and yours all bow down to me. So we... So his brothers go, what, what are you talking about? You think we're all going to bow down to you? You think you're going to be in charge of us? You're not my father. You've never heard that before, that term. Wow. You people are so protected. Amazing. You can't tell me what to do. And so he tells them this dream, which tells me, don't tell everybody everything you know. Only a fool does that. There are certain people you can tell things to and certain other people you can't. And so he, then he has another dream. And then he tells this to his dad. And he says, Dad, I, I saw this dream. The, I told the boys and they said I should tell you because they thought you'd really appreciate it. And so I saw the sun and the moon and, and, the, and 11 stars and they all bowed down to me. And it's interesting because Jacob gets exactly what he's saying. He's saying, what? Are you trying to say that me and your mom and your brothers are all going to bow down to you? Is that what you're trying to say? I mean, that might work on them, but you're going to try that on me, your father? Really? It's rather interesting. We see it repeated in chapter 12 of Revelation. If you ever want to know something in Revelation and how to interpret it, go back to Genesis. It's probably there. Like the sun, the moon, and the stars that are in chapter 12 with the dragon, with the seven heads, and all the people that say, I can't read the book of Revelation. It's like a cartoon to me. Well, all you have to do is understand some of the Old Testament, and it fits together quite nicely. And so Joseph has this dream, and his father gets wind of it, but his father now is going to keep this in mind. Because you see, God has spoken to him through dreams. And so maybe God is speaking to Joseph, but it just sounds like, He's got an overactive imagination. You know, it's funny, the things of God like that, especially in the miraculous. I don't know about you, but I'm always a little, hmm, I wonder. And you wonder, what's of God and what's of man? What's been inflated and, you know, what gift is being misused? And you always wonder, at least I do. I'm always very suspicious of those things. And I'm glad I'm not the only one because Jacob was even over his own son, after he himself has had God speak to him in dreams. And so he doesn't discount it completely. He keeps it in mind as he goes. So this week, we're going to move on from verse 12 to the end of the chapter, after he tells the dreams. I will figure it out one day. A couple of things that I want you to go over. There's the word providence. 
It's uh, not just a place in Rhode Island. Providence is a theological term which is applied to God, which is God naturally directing human affairs for a desired outcome. Uh, it's from the Latin pro providentia, meaning foresight or prudence, and that in turn is from pro means ahead, and vidir means to see. So providence is to see in advance, right? This has been your vocabulary day, uh, moment for the day. I want to remind you of Romans 15, 4, which says that, so whatsoever things are written before, meaning in the Old Testament here, were written for our learning, that we through the patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. That's the whole point of why I study the scriptures. That's the whole point of why I'm here. Because the word of God is there for our learning that we might have hope. And so as we go through here, I'll tell you, uh, that's my goal. That, that's what I'm trying to do here. Why is God doing all of this with Joseph? And most of you know the story of Joseph and how he goes from hero to zero and back again. Why is God doing this? It's an amazing thing because if you look back, if you remember, there was a prophecy given that God spoke and said this, and this is to Abram before he was even Abraham. He explains the history of Israel and what's going to happen. He says, then he said to Abraham, Abram, know certainly that your descendants will be strangers in a land that is not theirs and will serve them and they will afflict them 400 years. How did God know that? Oh, well, because he's God. Yeah. And it's written in the word of God long before it happened. So nobody just like back wrote it. 400 years and also the nation whom they serve, I will judge afterwards. They will come out with great possessions. He's talking about the Exodus, which hasn't, hasn't even happened yet. Now, as, as for you, you shall go to your fathers in peace and you shall be buried at a good old age. But in the fourth generation, they shall return here, meaning the land of Canaan. For the iniquity of the Amorites is not complete. What? God said, you guys are going to go away. Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph. And you guys are going to come back in 400 years. And you're going to come out with great possessions. You know, that's exactly what happened. This was promised to Abram before he was even Abraham, before he had any children, any descendants. It was prophesied that this would be happening. And that's what God's doing. And he says, I'm doing this because it's not time to judge the Amorites yet. He's going to judge the Amorites with Israel coming out of Egypt. So I think it's interesting. There's a timing factor in the scriptures here that God reveals when he speaks this prophecy that you and I wouldn't know otherwise. You ever go through something and you wonder why? Well, perhaps it's just me and two of you. I went to Bible college in my early 20s because I felt God called me into the ministry. I happened to be married and I had a one-year-old daughter. I don't advise this. I went to Bible college and went to school full-time and worked a full-time job while my wife stayed home and raised yet another child because we had another child in the midst of all this. And when I got out of Bible college, I did various things up to when I was 50 years old and I became a pastor of this church. So when I look at providence and I see God has a plan, when you're in the middle of it, it's hard to see. When you're learning about it before it ever happens, it's hard to know. But when you've been through it and you look back, that's when you go, aha. Because I can tell you from when I was in my early 20s to when I was 50, God was putting things into me, not so I could get this job, but so I could do this job. And it may be that you are in the middle of process somewhere. Understand and believe with all your heart that God's providence, not circumstance, not coincidence, but God's superintending providence is upon you if you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. He makes good things out of junk. He recycles all of our mess. Amen? Amen. 
So whatever mess you're in, whatever it is you're struggling with, I guarantee you, and the Word of God promises you, that God has it under control. There's an ultimate destination he's trying to arrive at, and usually it's the likeness of Christ in us. And that's worth something. All right, I'm going to stop preaching. I'm going to go back to teaching here. Verse 12. Then his brothers went to feed his father's flock in Shechem. And Israel said to Joseph, by the way, they just called him Israel. Did you notice that? You'll notice when they call him Jacob, which is his old name, he's usually doing a boneheaded move. When they call him Israel, he's usually doing something that's rather important and significant. It's one of those things that the Holy Spirit has put into the word that should raise a flag in your mind. I'm sorry, I went into Bible college mode. And Israel said to Joseph, are not your brothers feeding the flock in Shechem? Come, I will send you to them. And so he said to him, here I am. And he said to him, please go and see if it is well with your brothers and well with the flocks and bring back word to me. So he sent him out of the valley of Hebron and he went to Shechem. Now, you guys remember Shechem, right? It was a place of slaughter. And now those boys are going back there and, and eh, going back with their sheep to the place of slaughter. Is that a good idea? I don't know. I just figure there are certain neighborhoods I don't want to be bringing my sheep. Places where I've killed hundreds of people, probably one of them. But they're going there and presumably it's, it's a much nicer place to uh, take your sheep. And so that's where they're at, uh, sp supposedly. And so he says, go see how they're doing because you're my reporter. That's what you do. You go and check things out and then you bring word back to me is what they're doing wrong. Um, heck of a job, right? So he's going from Hebron to Shechem. Hebron, if you might remember, means fellowship. So they're going from a place of fellowship to the place of slaughter. I'm not sure I would do that. Just the names themselves are giving me hints here that maybe they shouldn't be there. I'm going to tell you something very definitively. Joseph is a type of Jesus Christ. Jesus himself left fellowship with the Father and stepped down and came to the place of slaughter for you and I. Even in this little simple errand, the Holy Spirit has transcribed this parallel to the life of Jesus Christ. And I just want you to be sensitive to that because as we go through, you're going to see every single thing points to Jesus. And I'll try not to stretch it too far, but you get the idea, right? In Matthew 21, Jesus tells a parable, and I wonder if he's thinking about Joseph. Finally, he sent his son to them saying, they will respect my son. But when the tenants saw the son, they said to themselves, this is the heir. Come, let us kill him and have his inheritance. And they took him and they threw him out of the vineyard and they killed him. Then therefore the owner of the vineyard comes. What will he do to those tenants? Jesus is telling a parable about himself that he has come to the world, that he came to introduce himself as God's only begotten son. He came to his own and his own did not receive him. And Jesus is telling about himself. And it's interesting how it parallels Joseph very closely. So as we look at Joe, we're going to see he does a lot of things that Jesus is going to emulate. Verse 15 now a certain man found him, and there he was, wandering in the field. 17 years old. By the way, he's got to go 60 miles away, find out where his brothers are in Shechem from Hebron. No GPS. No cell phone. And there he was, wandering in the field, because that's what you do when you're lost. And the man asked him, saying, what are you seeking? And he said, I am seeking my brothers. Please tell him. Please tell me where they are feeding their flocks. And the man said, they have departed from here, for I heard them say, let us go to Dothan. So Joseph went after his brothers and found them in Dothan. By the way, Dothan is another 10 miles north of where he's just wandered to. And he's wandering around in a field all by himself, 
looking in every direction, can't see his brothers. And he runs into a guy, and the guy tells him, go to Dothan. Uh, Dothan means double sick. <laughs> if Jesus ever came to a world that was sick, he came to a world that was double sick, didn't he? And that's where he found us. In Luke 19.10, it says, For the Son of Man has come to seek and to save that which was lost. That is Jesus' ministry in, a, in one verse. He came to seek and save that which was lost. And so Joseph is certainly a picture of Jesus here. And so Joseph went after his brothers, and he found them in Dothan. Now, when they saw him afar off, even before he came near them, they conspired against him to kill him. They said to one another, look, this dreamer, uh, actually means the king of dreams, is coming. Come, therefore, let us now kill him and cast him into some pit. And we shall say, some wild beast has devoured him. We shall see what will become of his dreams. Now that sounds pretty sick, right? For your own brothers to do that? I don't know what your brothers and sisters were like, but sitting and talking about how to kill you and throw you in a pit because of your dreams. There's a word for that. It's called jealousy. So these guys were conspiring about how to kill him, much like they did with Jesus. In fact, his own family didn't even understand him. His own brothers didn't receive him. In, in the book of John, we're told that there's a feast and the family's leaving. And they say, you know, you should go up because if you want to be famous, you want your name to get out there to be a big deal, you know, you should get out there and tell people, you know, who you are and, you know, and they were mocking him. And he goes, I'm not ready to go to this feast yet, but you guys go and, you know, I'll come when I, when I pick my time. And so they all left and Jesus came later, but he did it quietly because he didn't want to, he didn't want to have to deal with the mockers. And so even Jesus wasn't received, even in his own household. But Reuben heard it, by the way, he's the oldest, and he delivered him out of their hands. And he said, let us not kill him. And Reuben said to them, shed no blood, but cast him into this pit, which is in the wilderness, and do not lay a hand on him, that he might deliver him out of their hands and bring him back to his father. So it came to pass when Joseph had come to his brothers that they stripped Joseph of his tunic, the tunic of many colors that was on him. And they took him and they cast him into a pit. And the pit was empty. And there was no water in it. And they sat down to eat a meal. Isn't that interesting? So Reuben speaks up and he says, listen, let's not kill our brother. Let's not get any blood on our hands. But let's just throw him in this pit, throw him in the ground. And uh, by the way, this is a cistern. Um, they dig it out of solid rock typically. And once they have it dug and hewed out, they'll actually put a plasterer in there and they'll plaster the walls and it holds water because water is very rare in these places. And they'll run channels to it so it collects rainwater. But they found a cistern where there was no water and they, throw, they threw him in it. You guys know the story of Joseph, right? So Joseph gets stripped down and thrown in a hole in the ground and he's in the ground. I find it very interesting because Jesus Christ was also thrown into the earth and he was there for three days, wasn't he? Because he was rejected by his own people. And when they were done with that, they decided they would, ah, we're going we're to have lunch now. We almost killed our brother. Instead, we threw him in a hole and now we're going to have lunch. We're going to sit down. I mean, to be able to have something so casual after doing something so dramatic, I think shows the condition of their hearts. It's much like Pilate. If you remember Pilate doing all he could to not have Jesus crucified, he's put up a, an offer and he says, listen, here's Barabbas. And he tried every which way to get out of crucifying Jesus and the crowd just shouted out the more. And he said, they said, let, their, let his blood be on us and our children. And if you remember the famous thing where he goes and he washes his hands before everybody and he goes, listen, I am not guilty of this man's blood. That's kind of a half measure, isn't it? Pilate could have declared anything that he wanted to. Reuben is a picture of Pilate. 
who's taking a half measure to try to save his brother, but not standing up and saying, listen, you guys are out of your mind. As nutty as the kid is, you should not kill him and we should not throw him in a hole. But Reuben said, well, I could tell a story. I'll just tell him, yeah, let's throw him in a pit and leave him there. But Reuben planned on going back later and resurrecting him and pulling him out. If you know the story, you know what happens. He doesn't get a chance to. Because he's deceiving his brothers and his brothers are deceiving him. Because he doesn't even know what the brothers are up to and the brothers have no idea what he's up to. So you can see more dysfunction in the family. So feel better about wherever it is you came from. <laughs> then they lifted their eyes and they looked and there was a company of Ishmaelites coming from Gilead with their camels bearing spices, balm, myrrh on their way to carry them out of Egypt. Down to Egypt, sorry. So Judah said to his brothers, what profit is there if we kill our brother and conceal his blood? Come, let us sell him to the Ishmaelites and let not our hand be upon him for he is our brother in our flesh. Yeah, you really care for him, don't you? And his brothers listened. And the Midianite traders passed by, so the brothers pulled Joseph up and lifted him up out of the pit and sold him to the Ishmaelites for 20 shekels of silver. And they took Joseph to Egypt. First of all, you'll notice there are Ishmaelites, Midianites, and Ishmaelites. Which is it? If you know anything about caravans, they tend to travel all together. If you've ever gone on vacation with several other people and had to take more than one vehicle, you know what this is like in the conditioned uh, air conditioning in the summer. Uh, these guys were on camels. They would typically come together. Uh, if you remember who Midian is, Midian is the offspring of Abraham through Keturah, his second wife, and you guys don't care. Okay. So... He says, let's sell him. So Judah's the guy who says, we can make a profit on this thing. We don't have to kill him, number one, like Reuben said, don't do. And we don't have to just let him rot here. We can make some cash. So let's sell him. And the boys say, okay. But guess who wasn't involved in the negotiations? Reuben. They did this without Reuben's knowledge. Reuben's getting ready to be a rescuer and go back into the hole. But because he only took a half measure and he didn't take a full measure of speaking the truth, he misses his opportunity. So they sell Joseph off. It may have been that he was in there three days. What do you think? It's interesting that they buy him for, 30, for 20 pieces of silver. That was the price back then of a handicapped slave. So that tells you how much they thought of him. They sold their brother for cheap, like at a garage sale. It's interesting because in Matthew 27, 3, it says, Then Judas, his betrayer, seeing that he had been condemned, was remorseful and brought back the 30 pieces of silver to the chief priests and elders. Isn't it interesting that there's 20 pieces of silver for Joseph and 30 pieces of silver for Jesus? Very similar. Why was it less for Joseph? Because he's still not Jesus. He's just a picture. But anyway. And then Reuben returned to the pit. And indeed, Joseph was not in the pit. And he tore his clothes and he returned to his brothers and said, the lad is no more. And where shall I go? He was probably hoping to get back into the good graces of his dad. And now he can't do that because Joseph's gone. And he has no idea where he went. And the boys are going, yeah, huh. yeah, imagine that. Hmm. Huh. Not telling the truth. It's a very dysfunctional family. Because Reuben, because Reuben procrastinated, we have the, uh, the, the four horsemen of the apocalypse of procrastination over here. Any of you know what it is to uh, procrastinate? I know you're taking your time raising your hand because you're putting it off till later. <laughs> it's an amazing thing. Uh, I, I, I saw a meme on, online. Guy says, you know... I'm just going to check Twitter one time before I go to bed. Oh, look, the sun's coming up. <laughs> it's one of those things that just sucks your life away is your phone and your media. But So beware of that. Procrastination is one of those things where you just continue to put things off and, and then you tend not to do anything of value. You tend to just do whatever meaningless chore you have around to keep you busy. Uh, maybe you suddenly need a nap 
or any of these things. Whenever I have something to do, the four horsemen come to me. Patience is a virtue, but procrastination is not. You know, good things come to those who wait. You've, you've heard that? Doesn't apply, to, doesn't apply to procrastinators. Don't be a procrastinator. You're, 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 cutting off, you're cutting your own wrists. It's a terrible thing. Half-hearted measures can never withstand active wickedness. Half-hearted measures will never be able to stand active wickedness. If you think uh, wearing a Christian t-shirt is all you have to do to be a witness at your work, or say God bless you to your neighbor, and you think that's going to get them saved, half measures without speaking the whole truth, without warning somebody, hey, you're driving down a road and the bridge is out. You end up like Reuben going to find going to find someone who you thought was there that you would deliver and they're gone. And you don't want to do that. Half-hearted measures can never withstand active wickedness because people are much more zealous about doing wickedness than often Christians are about sharing the truth of who Jesus is. And so they took Joseph's tunic, killed a kid of the goats, that's a young one, not a child, and dipped the tunic in the blood. And they sent the tunic of many colors and they brought it to the father, to their father and said, we have found this. Do you know whether this is your son's tunic or not? It's like really bad acting even. <laughs> and he recognized it and said, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him. Without doubt, Joseph is torn to pieces. And so without getting a DNA sample, he gets duped. But it's rather interesting because if you remember, Jacob himself used the trick of killing a young goat and deceiving his father out of the blessing, remember? And he wore the goat skins on his arms and on the back of his neck so he smelled like Esau. It's an interesting thing. So the very thing that he used to perpetrate and defraud his father is the same thing that the children are now using on him. It's funny how the sins of the fathers sometimes go to the second, third, and fourth generations. We hand these things off either by our example or by our direct teaching of them to our children. Uh, so be careful. And so he sees it and he makes some assumptions. He says, it is my son's tunic. A wild beast has devoured him, which is what they wanted him to believe. And Jacob, if you remember, is a bit of a, a worry wart. And so he immediately goes to the worst case scenario and says, that must be what it is. He can't possibly be alive. There's no way that he could live through this. It reminds me of somebody else who left some clothing behind, stained with his own blood. And the disciples themselves thought Jesus was dead. Certainly he's dead. We saw him crucified. We saw him taken down and thrown in the tomb. And you remember Peter and John come running into the tomb and they look and they see the, the cloth that he was wrapped with that is there. And his face was wrapped with a napkin, but the napkin was folded up nicely and placed to the side. Although the rest of it was deflated like a balloon that had lost all of its air. And it says, John looked in the tomb and he believed. Amen. But Peter ran in and was looking all around. He thought for sure the Romans had taken him. And so he falls into the shoes of Jacob. But John believed. And he knew that Jesus had risen because of the stories that had come. In John 26 to 7, we can read it here. And then Simon Peter came following him and went into the tomb and saw the linen cloths lying there and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. You don't do that if you're stealing a body. If you're stealing a body, you keep the clothes on. You don't strip the body down to be naked and carry the body off and fold the the napkin up. You don't, you don't do that when you're stealing a body. Everything speaks to resurrection, and yet there was a giant lie that was perpetrated that he was taken by his disciples. 
That's no way to be carrying a body. And you, first thing in the morning, it's going to look a little suspicious, don't you think? <laughs> and then Jacob tore his clothes. He put on sackcloth on his waist. This is his way of mourning. And he mourned for his son many days. And all his sons and his daughters arose to comfort him, but he refused to be comforted. And he said, for I shall go down into the grave to my son in mourning. Thus his father wept for him. In other words, I will never be happy again until the day that I die because he's gone. That sounds like a pretty deep, dark depression to me. None of his sons could comfort him. None of his daughters would comfort him. Nothing would comfort him. I'm going to be miserable until the day I die. You know, he made up his mind to be that way. He didn't have to be that way. And because I think he spent way too much time doing that, his sons missed a lot of really good fathering if he was up to it. Envy. They were envious of their brother because he had dreams. He was dad's favorite. And because they were envious, they did what they did. Be careful that you don't have jealousy and envy in your heart because you don't know where that will take you. In fact, James tells us here in chapter three, who is wise and understanding among you? Let him show by good conduct that his works are done by the meekness of wisdom. But if you have bitter envy and self-seeking in your hearts, do not boast and lie against the truth. This wisdom, you can put that in, in quotation marks, does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. For where e envy and self-seeking exist, confusion and every evil thing are there. If you've got envy or jealousy in your heart, it's time to get your face before the Lord. Because there, every good and perfect gift comes from the Father of heavenly lights in whom there is no shadow of turning. If somebody has it better than you, it's because God gave it to them. So who are you really mad at? You see, they were really upset with Joseph, but it wasn't Joseph's fault. They were really mad at God that he was favored. They were mad at their dad that he was favored. And they took it out on the wrong person. In Mark 15, 10, this interesting little thing about envy, for he knew that the chief priests had handed him over because of envy. You see, the reason Jesus was handed over to the Gentiles, to the Romans, is because they were envious of him. And Pilate knew it. And instead of him standing up and delivering Jesus, he didn't. Certainly it was by the foreknowledge of God that all of this happened and according to God's plan. And yet he will have to stand before God for his actions. Just like Pilate. Now, the Midianites had sold him in Egypt to Potiphar, an officer of Pharaoh, and the captain of the guard. So Joseph goes from being hated and despised, thrown in a pit, almost killed, sold off for 20 pieces of silver, and he gets sold as a slave in Egypt. One of the worst places you could be. Egypt is always a picture of the world and the flesh. And he ends up in Egypt, far away from his dad, and his dad doesn't even know he's alive. Jacob will mourn him for 20 years even though he's not dead. He will mourn him for 20 years. And so Joseph goes to Egypt. He goes from hero with a nice coat, with the love of his father, with a job watching over everything, telling, you know, telling dad what the boys are doing wrong. He went from that guy to being a slave, to being a complete and utter bondservant. In Philippians 2, 7 and 8, speaking of Jesus says, but he made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. 
And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death of the cross. Spoken of Jesus, Jesus wasn't sold off. He willingly laid his life down, which is where Jesus supersedes the, even the picture of Joseph. And he did that because you and I are broken sinners and there's no way we can fix ourselves. We're not qualified. And as much good as we think we do, it's always contaminated with something underneath that's not right. And God knew how broken we were. And the only way that we can escape the punishment we deserve is if somebody else takes it for you, but they have to be completely innocent. And there was only one who could do that. And that was God himself in the form of his son, Jesus Christ. Amen? That's why Genesis is 25% Joseph. So that when Jesus shows up, we would go, oh, wow, yeah, I get it. The story's there for a really good reason. Do you think Joseph knew what was happening? Absolutely not. And yet, through the entire section and all of the narration, Joseph doesn't complain once. He trusts in God's providence. He rolls with it. And wherever he goes, he's successful because God is with him. The scripture says so. He serves Potiphar's house. Potiphar's house gets blessed. I certainly hope you have an employer who gets blessed by your presence. And everywhere Joseph goes, he uses his gifts and his calling by God to be a benefit and fruit to the people around him. He doesn't sit and say, huh, my family, they, they all hate me. He doesn't get all into his, he doesn't cry into his coffee, you know. He, he's busy using what God gave him and hoping that God will turn it around because he believes in something called providence. He has faith that God is ultimately in control of these things. And that is what sees Joseph through. And we'll see that in the rest of the story. Providence. God working in natural means, not supernatural means, not a miracle, but working through natural means, that which falls into his desire. It's God's providence. We sometimes call it a coincidence. I don't believe coincidence isn't a kosher word. Romans 15, 4 tells that whatever things are written, were written for our learning. And I think you guys noticed some things as we went through looking at Joseph. Holy mackerel, I didn't see that when I went through that last time. And we, through patience and comfort of the scriptures, might have hope. Because God does know the beginning from the end. Romans 8, 28. We know that all things work together for good. For those that love God. For those who are called according to his purpose. To whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son. He predestined you to be conformed to the image of his son. So he'll never stop. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. Moreover, whom he predestined, he also called. Whom he called, he also justified. And whom he justified, these he also glorified. You see, that process at the very end, ending in glorification, is where Joseph is going. And ultimately, it ends in his glorification. He becomes the number two guy in all of Egypt. And that's what's going to happen with us because of Jesus Christ. The one whom he's predestined and called, he justifies and he glorifies. It's a process that doesn't get interrupted because you fall short, because you're not good enough, because you're a bonehead. It's something that God promised based upon his character, not on yours. That's the complete difference between Christianity and every other religion in the world. Every other religion in the world says, you've got to be good enough. You've got to do all the right things or you're not going to heaven. And oh, if you do one wrong thing, that's it, you're done. Well, why would Jesus have to come and die for that? Jesus came to die to give you new life to, so that the Holy Spirit can come and dwell inside of you so that the old could be gone. Behold, all things are new. That you would have a new heart and a new mind. That you would think those things that God would have you think and feel those things God would have you feel because he's made you new in Christ Jesus. Can I get an amen? amen. If you've accepted Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, you're a new creation in Christ Jesus. The old things are gone. Behold, all things are new. You just got to learn how to use your new feet. 
and I'm hoping that this helps. In Philippians 1, 6, it says, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. I believe that of every one of you. I believe that of myself, which is harder to believe. That God began a good work and he's going to continue it. Why? Because God doesn't quit. Amen. We will. We'll do the stupidest things. But God will never stop developing you and making you into the image of Jesus Christ. Whatever it is that you're going through, God is involved. Unless you don't know him. If you don't know him, you don't have the special privilege of being his kid. You're not wearing the, the robes of righteousness. But you could. It's as easy as giving up. What we're going to do today, after I release you guys and we have a little bit of food and some coffee, is we're going to have two baptisms right out here. Two people that want to give public testimony that they've given their lives to Jesus Christ. They're going to identify with his death going down into the water. That's the death of self. The death of self-centeredness. The death of whatever it is that they had planned for themselves. They're, they're picturing it in the water. And then they're identifying with his resurrection as they come up to live in newness of life. I would love for you guys all to come out and see this. After the last song, we're going to give you about 15 minutes or so so the guys can get changed and uh, you guys can grab some coffee and then we'll let you know and we'll go right outside and we'll listen to their testimonies, okay? Next week is a bit of a hiccup because we get off of Joseph and we're going to look at Judah and Tamar, which is, it's a very interesting hiccup and you wonder, why is this in the story? It's a very important thing to be in the story, and we'll talk about that next week. If you guys come, will you come? Yes. Okay, I'm looking at all of you. I'm looking at all of you. <laughs>